Good morning. Morning. Good morning. It's weather like we've had the last few days that makes me certain I do not want to go to hell. <laughs> Laugh as you will, I moved to Montana to get away from weather like this. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Ephesians uh, chapter 6. We're going to be there for a while today. Uh, we'll get there in a minute, but I want you to go ahead and get there. Ephesians chapter 6. Before we get into today's word, um, I've had a number of people, I, I did not get any ask the pastor questions in writing, but I've actually had a number of people ask me kind of the same question over the last couple of days. What do you think about the Supreme Court's decision? I am not surprised. Okay. Um, the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court of this land, but its supremacy does not extend to Christ. <coughs> Christ is the head. Uh, I don't care what the governing authorities say <coughs> in regard to this. This is the final arbiter of where I stand. Okay? Um, now, having said that, I need to make sure you guys understand that homosexuality is a sin, but it's a sin just like any other sin, okay? And we are incredibly ridiculous in our favorite sins that we like to pick on, okay? We like to pick and choose which ones that we're going to come out and condemn. God condemns all sin, okay? All of it. You know the, the little white lie you told? God condemns that. Um, we all have sin that affects us. It is all an offense and an abhorrence to God. Okay? We need to understand that the people that are caught up in this lifestyle are deceived. And quite honestly, they're deceived by a lot of the church. Okay? Because the church has gone to two extremes. We've gone to one extreme where we've already got them burning in hell without the opportunity of the grace that we've received. Or we've gone to the other end where it's just not sin and everybody's going to heaven. Look, Christ addressed sin head on. But he spoke the truth in love. Okay, And if your heart's desire is not to see them redeemed, shut up. Okay? We are called to be ambassadors of the message of hate. Right? Wrong. That's not what the word says. We're called to be ambassadors of the message of reconciliation. Restoring people to a right relationship with God. Yeah, there has to be an immediate awareness of sin. But ultimately, if we abolish homosexuality from the face of the planet, but did not address the salvation issue, the problem of separation from God, we have still consigned them to an eternity in hell. Okay? So, am I going... To, does this affect me in any way? No, it doesn't really affect me at all. Okay? Because really, what... People that are engaged in this lifestyle are already engaged in the lifestyle. Okay? So whether the Supreme Court validates their reasoning or not, our job is to reach people. Okay? And our heart needs to be for people. And we need to understand that this struggle is not against the gay, lesbians, bi's, and transgendered. Okay? They're pawns. They're victims. Okay? So, how does it affect me? It doesn't. I was expecting it. I've been expecting it. Quite honestly, I'm surprised it took this long. I'm also kind of surprised it happened so quick. So, moving forward, 
Ephesians chapter 6. Kind of ironic that this is where we're going today. We're going to pick up in verse 10. Now, we've been talking about spiritual warfare. We've talked about knowing who our enemy is. We've talked about knowing ourself. We've talked about the battleground. We've understood, hopefully we've understood, that our great enemy is the devil, who is real. Hopefully we've understood that our capacity for sin is also our enemy. Okay? Sarks, the flesh, that, that works against us in opposition to the spirit. Hopefully we've also gathered that the culture, the world that we live in, is our enemy. Okay? And if you, if you stop right there, it can look a little overwhelming. And it should be. Because of your own self, you have no power to overcome any of those. But we don't stop there. Because the word says, if God be for us, perfect. If God be for us, who can be against us? No one. All right? So we're going to pick up verse 10. <coughs> finally. Now, finally, because Paul is making a point at the end of his letter. Now, you need to understand, this is not an afterthought. This is kind of like, I've, I've expressed my heart to you, and I've got something really important I want to share with you. Finally, here it is, all right? So, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mysteries of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now my goal today is to cover the first three verses. Okay? That's, that's my objective. We're going to see where God takes us. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. <clears throat> You understand that you do not have strength to wage this war. Okay? You in and of yourself do not have the ability to fight this fight. Now, you might be able to stand for a little while. You might even be able to rock the boat a little bit. But ultimately, if you are operating in your own strength, you will fall. Okay? Thankfully, we are not stuck with just our strength. Be strong in the Lord. Okay? In the Lord. Okay? Now, a lot of us are strong in our political ideology. A lot of us are strong in our opinions. A lot of us are strong in our willingness to be loud to support our political ideology or our opinions. But a lot of us are incredibly weak in the Lord. Okay? A lot of us simply, uh, we kind of feel like God's pointing us in this direction and off we go, full gallop. And oftentimes, we come to the precipice and start screaming, Oh God! Help! He's got you. He'll turn you back around. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now, what is His might? 
Well, we can't really even give anything to compare it. I mean, it's by his word that the universe is held together. Okay? It's by his word that everything came into being. How do you estimate the might of someone who spoke creatively? Okay? I mean, we have some incredibly gifted people in this church. We have people that are gifted musically, that can sing, that can play instruments, and they can create songs. Okay? I'm more in the camp of making a joyful noise. Okay? But thank God he doesn't say make a beautiful noise. He says make a joyful noise. All right? So we can all be there. But God spoke creatively all things into existence. All right? So how do we estimate the might of God? Well, there's nothing to compare it to. The devil has power far beyond ours. We talked about that when we talked about know your enemy. We're going to talk about that again here in just a minute. But his might is as nothing compared to God. Now think about the ministry of Jesus when he was here on the earth. Do we have an account anywhere of a demon overcoming him? Do we have an account anywhere of the devil overcoming him? No, I mean the devil took him out later in the desert to be tempted. The spirit let him out and the devil's who? Do, do, do. What does Jesus do? He quotes scripture right back. Now, trust me folks, the devil knows this word probably better than you do. And that's pretty dangerous thing, okay? Because he's going to start quoting scripture. As a matter of fact, um, two days ago, I felt God prompting me, I need to do a media pass, okay? So if you're trying to get a hold of me, please don't use Facebook, because I'm, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not reading the news. I'm not getting, because I found myself getting really frustrated and really tense and really uptight with some of the crap that brothers and sisters in Christ are preaching. Now, it's not just about the Supreme Court the thing that came out a couple days ago. That's just, just garbage that I see being put forth by brothers and sisters in Christ that has nothing to do with Christ. It has to do with their opinion about how the things should be run. Okay? Now, I, I, everybody has opinions. My grandfather used to say, everybody's, they're like armpits. Everybody's got them. They all stink. Okay? And, and you're entitled to your opinion. But first and foremost, what are you? Matthew 28 says what? You are given a commission to be what? Go, therefore, into all the world and be... We're his witnesses. We are to preach his word. Okay? If people have to wade through all the crap we're spouting to get to that, we've got a problem. We've got an issue. And I was, I was sitting in my chair and I, I, was, I, I got about three comments into Facebook. And God just started kind of pounding at me. And I was tuned. And you, you would not believe how many incredible notes I write on Facebook and delete. Man, I type and I type and I type and I type and I get it and I read back and God says, uh, no. And I, God, I'll just retype it. I'll make it more Christ-like. I'll be more loving. You're an idiot with love. <laughs> he doesn't want that either. Okay, delete. All right? And God just really pushed me. He said, you, you need to lay this down. And you need to get back here. This is, this is where home is. Okay? This is where home is for the Christian. Okay? And if you spend more time on Facebook than you do in the Word, you're living far from home. Okay? If you spend more time uh, on TV than you do in the Word, you're, you're living far from home. Okay? That, that's just a simple fact, guys. Okay? The food that you feed yourself is what powers your body. Okay? <coughs> and if you're not powering your body with this, you're in trouble. You, you're weak. Okay? So, his might, put on the whole armor of God. It, it's kind of funny because the, the word here um, for whole armor, it's actually one word in the Greek, 
and, and it's, it's the same word that we get panoply from. Okay? And, and it means all of it. Put on all of the armor, not just pieces. Okay? Not just, you know, uh, today I think I'll wear the helmet of salvation and relish in my salvation, and I'm going to go out in the battle with just the helmet. Good luck headbutting the devil. Okay? Your, your helmet is not going to cover all of you. I think today I'm going to have my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Do you even know what that means? Be here next week. Or the following week. Because I don't know when we're going to get there. Just keep coming. I'll get there eventually. So put on the full armor of God. Fully equipped. Why? Why does God want you to put on the armor? Why is Paul putting this to us? Put on the full armor. Well, come on, it's right there in the verse. Because God does not want you on your back. God does not want you on your rump. God wants you to stand in this battle. Okay? There are no bench warmers in this battle. We can't afford bench warmers. We need people that are willing to stand. And I love what he says a little bit further down. He says, uh, and when you've done all that you know to do, stand. Don't be moved. Okay? And sometimes it's all we can do to just stand. Sometimes we're, we're uh, God, I, I don't feel like I'm moving forward at you. Stand. Stand. Stand your ground. Okay? Because God is your help, and it is His strength that is going to bring you through this. Stand. Stand firm. Look at the promises that God has given us. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. He is steadfast. He is the shield about you. He is your refuge and your fortress. Stand. What are we to stand against? Because it doesn't say, you know, stand against anybody that disagrees with you. Because we can, quite honestly, um, how, many, how many were here at the brothers' meeting Thursday? Let me see your hands. Okay. I love Thursday. Because as iron sharpens iron... Sparks flew. Okay? And that's okay. That's not a bad thing. I mean, we have got to be pushing each other, testing each other, making sure we're standing firm, knowing what we stand for. Okay? Stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Actually, uh, some other translations have a different word there for schemes. Does anybody have a different word there for schemes? Plots. Plots. Strategies. Strategies. Wiles. Wiles. Okay. Um, it's kind of interesting because the word that we have here for schemes is methodia. Okay? And, and literally translated, it can mean cunning arts, evil cunning, deceit, or trickery. Okay? Now, does that give you a little bit of a clue of what you're standing against? Does that, does that give you a little bit of a clue of what you're standing against? You're standing against the deceit that the father of lies is spewing. How can you stand against deceit? Well, we identify the lies. We replace it with the truth. In order to identify the lie and replace it with the truth, you have to know the truth. Okay? We're going to get into that again when we get into the armor. Okay? So, we have to stand against the cunning, evil cunning, wiles, plots, strategies, deceitfulness of the enemy. And we can only do that as we know truth. Now, let me, let me clarify a point here real quick. 
This is not dependent on your ability to memorize this. Okay? I'm not saying that you guys have got to memorize from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Although if you can, do it. <coughs> Quite honestly, I think that's one of the lost disciplines of the church is memorizing scripture. It's, it's horrendous how many people don't even really know what's in here. And you're going up against an enemy that does, and he can take it and tweak it a little bit, twist it a little bit here, shake it a little bit there, and have you believing all kinds of lies. Okay? So, what I'm saying is you've got to be in this regularly. Read it. But don't just stop at reading it. Study it. Familiarize yourself with it. Start making connections. Because it's all inspired of God. It's all coming straight from Him. It's cohesive. It's built block upon block. So know the Word, but we have a secret weapon that helps us against these deceits and these lies and these tricks. Because God has given to us what? The Holy Spirit. Okay? So it's not like you're going into this empty-handed. You're going into this with a teacher that will guide you into all truth, that will open your eyes, that will open your mind, that will open your heart, and he'll take those things that you're not even realizing that you're getting, and he's going to plant them deep in your heart. And then when the situation comes up, boop, there it is. Okay? But you've got to get it put in there. So stand against the schemes of the devil. Bear with me for just a second. Where is our war waged? Where do we do battle? Well, in the next verse, verse 12, for Paul says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers, over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces uh, of evil in the heavenly places. i got to read this word for word, because I memorized this in the NIV. Okay? Um, Our battle takes place in the spiritual realm. And that's really hard for us because we do not see the spiritual realm. Okay? We are not engaged in a struggle against flesh and blood. Okay? Although this battle may be revealed in the flesh, that's not where it's taking place. Okay? Um, the last day of the Battle of Gettysburg, the Confederates lined up over 100 cannons and fired it all at a single spot in the Union line. And the cannonade went on for quite a while and was heard over 100 miles away from the actual battleground. Okay? Now, 100 miles away, people are hearing this what sounds like distant thunder, and they know something is going on. But they may not know what. A lot of times we are just like them in this life. We hear the thunder, but we don't really know what's going on. And if we don't understand that the thunder is actually the sound of cannons being fired and war being waged, oh, about our merry way we go. We have to understand that even though we see this battle being waged or played out in the physical, it is being waged in the spiritual. Okay? And if you think you can go into it with your physical strength and accomplish it without dealing with the spiritual, you'll fail. It's as simple as that. 
okay? You have to wage it on the level and the means whereby God has given it to us to wage it. I'm going to look at a little bit here out of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. You don't need to turn there. I'm just going to read a couple passages. Uh, chapter 10. Um, I'm going to start in verse 3. Uh, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Okay? Now, Paul just made my point very clearly. I mean, gosh, you guys don't even need me. Just read the word. Okay? Our struggle is not according to the flesh. We, we walk in the flesh. We, we, we're here. I don't believe Paul is talking that we're walking in sin. I believe Paul is talking that we're, we're, we're just among people. Okay? The word there is sarks. It just means this. Okay? We walk in this world, but we do not battle in this world. We don't battle in the flesh. We wage war on a spiritual level, but it doesn't end there. <coughs> because look what he says in the next verse. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, whose power is it we use? Go back to Ephesians 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. It's His strength that He has given us to wage war with and not just to glorify ourselves. Oh yeah, you guys can call me Ajax. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, D don't call me Ajax, please. I think of a, like a scrubbing power. Um... We wage war according to the power that he has given us to tear down strongholds. Well, what does that even mean? What are strongholds? I don't know. It could be anything. Because what might be a stronghold against you might be nothing to me. Okay? I know there are strongholds that the enemy has built. And... One of the things we need to understand about the enemy is, is his nature is deceitfulness and he wants to pull the wool over our eyes. That's the angel of light part of his nature. He wants to appear like it's a good thing. And if we don't know the truth, we just go along, happy-go-lucky. But God says, no, 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 no. That's a stronghold that needs to come down. Now, Another trick that he does is he just, man, he builds a stronghold right in front of your face. There it is. Ooh. What are you going to do about it? Oh, there's a stronghold, God! Let me go around. Go around? No, go through. Tear that stronghold down. God has given you divine power for the tearing down of strongholds. Why? For your glory? No. For his. For his glory. To set people free. To deliver them. To set the captives free. You, you, you understand that's the whole ambassador part that we are. We're to go to the captives and tell them that there's freedom to be had. To let those who are bound free. <clears throat> For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, quite honestly, this is one of those things that I think about that probably has no basis. I, I'm guessing. I think Paul is just laying out for us here that there is a hierarchy in the demonic realm. Uh, Dennis and Jeannie have a phrase that I think describes it perfectly. New level, new devil. Okay? Um, Christy and I have seen over the last 15 months where 
we have struggled in a certain area, and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed, and God gives us victory in that area. And that devil that comes against us to try and get us knocked down in that area, after a while, we understand, oh, wait a minute. This is an attack. No, we're not going to fall for this anymore. Boop. Out the devil goes. You suppose then we're free? Uh-uh, because he just high-fives another one on his way out that's coming in. Okay? And then, Christy and I find a new struggle. See, the war does not end until God comes back, till Jesus Christ comes back and puts all things right. Until that point, we are battles, we are soldiers in battle, and we are battling till he come back or take us home. I'm okay with either. All right? So, there's a hierarchy that I believe is being laid out here, and I think there are certain levels that are assigned to us that are probably like the little guys, you know, those ones that whisper and get us to be kind of tense with each other, and, oh, did you hear what that person did? I was talking about this, and that person gave me a look. Did you see that look that person gave me? I don't know what they're thinking. They're thinking that I'm a fool. <coughs> I'm, gonna, I'm not even... i got to talk to someone about this. Hey, did you see what happened? You know, I heard that they were really bad-mouthing me to other people, and, you know, I think this is something that we need to deal with. Yeah, go ahead and call Susie. We'll deal with it with her. But don't call that person. Okay. Oh, uh, well, you know what? That's gossip. <gasps> gossip. Oh, I'm not supposed to gossip. Okay. I won't gossip anymore. That person gives me a look. Well, is everything okay between you and I? Because I, I was... No, uh, no, I just realized I left my pot roast on and it's probably burning. <laughs> oh, whew, good. Okay. That devil's been kicked out. A new devil comes in. All right? If you do not believe in the existence of the devil and the demonic forces, you have fallen to the lie that the devil has created. Okay? A line from the movie The Usual Suspects. The greatest trick the devil pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. C.S. Lewis actually comments, he says, there are two dangers to Christians in regard to the devil. One, you do not believe that he exists. And two, you become overly familiar with him, overly interested in him. And both of them are equally deadly. Okay? So we need to understand that he exists, that he is our enemy, that he is working very hard and his forces are working very hard to tear us down, to keep us bound. He's not greater than the one that lives in us, that has given us divine power to rebuke the devourer, to stand firm, has equipped us for battle. And it's, you know, it, it's, I don't have one of my grandsons in here. I need someone small. Yeah, Ben, you're not small. I need a child. Okay. Keegan, come here. Come here. I just need to use you for an example, sweetheart. And I didn't bring my nunchucks, so you're okay. <laughs> Keegan is a warrior. God has called her. God has appointed her. God has armed her, and she is to stand against the forces of the enemy. Now, you guys may look at Tegan and go, well, she's not all that big. But I'm standing behind her. And see, when you stand, God is right behind you, and he's got your back. And the devil comes and he flicks those little darts, and God watches. If you start to fall, start to fall, start to Oh, okay. 
I just told her to stand. Wait a minute, Pastor. <laughs> He's got us. And he will not allow anything to come against us that he has not prepared us and equipped us to deal with. And sometimes it takes us two or three tries to deal with it, but he's got us. He's holding our back. He's watching. He said, no, uh, 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 that's not allowed. You're not allowed to do that to this one. And there are times, and I know God has been incredibly gracious to me, where I feel like I've just been ravaged in the back, where God says, you know what? Let me take this one for a little while. Okay? I'll deal with it. You rest. I've still got you. I'll deal with it. Okay? When I've recovered, he says, okay, you ready, kid? Back to the battle lines. Get the shield up. Get the sword ready. You're in battle. I got your back. Okay? Thank you, Tegan. Okay? Now, a lot of times, we feel like we're all alone in the battle. There are two lies about that that you need to be aware of. One, God has promised that where you are, he will be. Okay? He has promised it, and he is faithful to his word. Two, God has put into place his body here on earth, so you should never be alone. Okay? The devil comes against you. Things start to look bleak. Put the call out. Put the call out. Hey, hey, guys, I need prayer. I'm struggling. I'm facing this issue, and I just need God to come up alongside of me and take care of it. Pray. We have people in this church that spend hours in prayer for you. But a lot of times they have no idea what you're going through. Pray. Okay? Don't feel like you're in the battle alone. The enemy wants to single you out and get you alone, get you out from the protection of the body. God says, no, 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 no. You come back in here. You stay here. It's safer here than there. Okay? As a member of the body, when you see somebody that's struggling, when you see somebody that is getting ravaged, come up alongside them. Come and put your arm underneath them. Help them to stand. Encourage them. We're here. The enemy has no victory over you. We are standing with you. Our God is victorious. Our God has promised the victory. We have to stand until we see it. We're here. We've got you. Okay? This is part of why it is so incredibly important to be a part of a local fellowship. Okay? You've got to be knitted in. There's strength there. Okay? So we are called to strength, but not our strength. His strength. Okay? We are called to be fully equipped. All the weapons that he's given us for the battle, he's given us. It's, we're, we're to wear them. We're to be prepared. Nobody sits on the bench. Everybody goes. Everybody's on the line. We are called to battle of a spiritual nature, not a physical one. Now, like I said, it will be played out physically. We have got to make people aware of where we stand. When we do the life chain, we get out there and we tell people, we're standing with the unborn. The unborn, God sees as precious. And we believe that it is an offense to him to take that life. We do make a stand, but are we doing it out of love? Or are we doing it out of pride? Okay? One of the things that I heard this week I want to uh, share with you. Um, I've been listening a lot to the voice of the martyrs. And there was a pastor from Syria that was on. And... Uh, um, Todd Middleton just, just, he didn't even do an interview. He just put this guy on and said, say what's on your heart. And this pastor was sharing how in Syria they prayed for years for a revival. Praying and praying and praying, God, we want to see revival here. 
And, and this guy shared that before the, the um, Civil War started, Syria was rated by the United Nations as the fourth safest country in the world. Okay, Safest. They were prosperous. They were safe. There was not a lot to cause any kind of trouble for them. And they were praying, God, we want to see revival break out. And the government actually offered them free of charge the largest stadium in Syria, in Damascus, free of charge to hold a revival in. And God said, no. It's not time. This is not what I want for you. And so they said, oh, okay, God, I mean, it's, 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 this is what we were looking for. And God said, no, this is not time. Right now, we need to work on unity. There needs to be unity in the body of Christ. So the churches started gathering together and trying to build unity. And a number of them came together. Some of them stood back and said, oh, no, we're not going to stand with you. We've got, we got our own thing up here. Well, then the rebellion broke out. And overnight, the country fell apart. And the Christians were stuck because the rebels saw them as being more sympathetic to the government, and the government just bombed whoever happened to be in the city where the rebels were, and then you add into this chaos, ISIS. ISIS comes in and starts declaring, okay, are you a Christian? Good. <laughs> and the church is going, God, what happened? What happened? We were praying for revival, and now we're facing persecution like we've never seen before. God said revival comes with a cost. Are you willing to pay the cost? And they started seeing revival take place on a scale that has never been seen in the Muslim world historically. They are seeing hundreds of Muslims come into church on Sunday because they want to know what these people believe. Because, you know, it's not just Christians that are being evicted. It's not just Christians that are being beaten. It's not just Christians that are being shot. It's anybody that disagrees with the philosophy of the particular group that happens to be in the town. So ISIS is wiping out other kinds of Muslims. The rebels are wiping out anybody that doesn't agree with them. The government is wiping out anybody that doesn't. So everybody, but the Christians are going through and they're sharing. We've lost our house. We've lost everything we have. But we have a blanket. Come with us. We'll share our blanket with you. And the Muslims are going, why, why would you do this? It's Muslims that did this to you. Because that's our God. That's the nature of our God. Christ came to save, not to condemn, to save. And, and there are two different pastors that I listened to speak. One of them was in uh, Libya, and they were actually with uh, YWAM Frontiers, and then this pastor in Syria. And, and something that they both said that is happening among the Muslims is God is giving them dreams and visions. In one village um, in Libya, in one night, 30 men had the exact same dream, okay? A dream in which a man in white, who said his name was Yesu, called them and said, come and follow me. 30 men in one village, in one night. There's revival going on in the Muslim world that far supersedes the horrific things that are happening. You look at the history of the church, anytime there's been persecution of the church, the church grows. It doesn't diminish, it grows. And the last thing that this pastor said before he was done, he said, America, I want you to understand, Christians in America, you're praying for revival, but it comes with a cost. Are you willing to pay the cost? Because he said, I believe persecution is coming to America. And I believe it's coming a lot quicker than you think it will happen. Because keep in mind, this is a pastor who was living a lifestyle very similar to ours in Syria four or five years ago with no concerns. The nations around him in chaos. But hey, man, Syria is good. We're good. And overnight, everything changed. Overnight. And he said, we have to be ready to pay the price for revival. And it could cost you all your possessions. It could cost you your life. It could cost you your family. 
Are you willing to give that up to further his kingdom that those who hate you might be saved? Because one thing that he said that really stuck to me, he said when ISIS came in, they already had this struggle going on between the rebels and the government, and, and there was chaos going on there. But when ISIS came in, they started praying, and, and they were praying out of fear. And they were even praying salvation for ISIS, but it was out of fear. God saved them. That way they don't kill us. I, I would pray that kind of prayer. But then as they started praying, God started doing a work in them. And as God started changing their heart, they started praying out of love for those people. A love that was not of their own, because, I mean, these are people that are, are killing them, that are taking all their stuff away. They're, they're hurting their families. And they start praying for them out of love, and that's when revival started breaking out. Okay? Father, I ask, Lord God, that you would prepare our hearts. Father, that you would help us to be mindful that we are engaged in a contest, in a battle, in a war with an enemy that despises us, that seeks to kill us, to steal from us, to destroy us. We are in war with an enemy that in every way surpasses us. But Father, you are on our side. You live inside of us. You are the one who has the might and the authority and the power to accomplish anything. Father, I ask that as we study your word and as we prepare for battle, Father, that you would give us your protection, your strength, that we would stand firm, unshaken, unmoving. Father, that we would understand that the battle is being war waged in a spiritual realm. And we see its fruit in the physical. I ask, Lord God, that you would help us to understand how best to fight this war. And I ask, Lord God, that we would lean on each other. That, Father, as you have pulled this body together, that we would stand together in support of each other, Father interceding for each other, praying for each other, lifting each other up, encouraging each other, exhorting each other, and even if necessary, admonishing each other. <clears throat> we thank you, God, for your grace, for your mercy and your love. We bless you today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.